Good evening. I'm Andrea Jayaviran. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Graduate Center, and I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's event, a conversation between two literary masters, Andre Asaman and Alexander Heyman. The Graduate Center's Public Programs Office, the host of this evening, runs a lively series of events from conversations to panel discussions to performances with distinguished artists, journalists, scholars, and performers. I invite you to visit our website for more information and for upcoming programs. I'd also like to thank both the Graduate Center's Writers Institute and the Leon Levy Center for Biography, who co-sponsored this evening. And finally, we'd like to remind you that books are on sale. McNally Jackson will be selling just outside of the auditorium, and both uh, writers have graciously agreed to sign books this evening as well. So tonight, we are delighted to be hosting this special conversation between Andre Asaman and Alexander Heyman, two writers who need very little introduction. So let me just say a few words about each one of them so that we can begin the discussion. Hailed by Esquire magazine as a maestro, a conjurer, a channeler of universes, Alexander Heyman has written four acclaimed works of fiction. The novel, The Lazarus Project, which was a finalist for the 2008 National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award, and three collections of short stories. The Question of Bruno, Nowhere Man, which was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and Love and Obstacles. His most recent book, The Book of My Lives, brings together essays published since 2000, mostly in The New Yorker. Born in Sarajevo, Mr. Heyman visited Chicago in 1992, intending to stay for a matter of months. And while he was there, of course, Sarajevo came under siege, and he was unable to return home. He wrote his for first story in English in 1995 and, incredibly, less than a decade later, was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2003 and then a Genius Grant from the MacArthur Foundation in 2004. Andre Asaman is the, collect is the author of the celebrated Whiting Award-winning memo, memoir, Out of Egypt, an account of his childhood as a Jew growing up in post-colonial Egypt. His other books of nonfiction include False Papers, Essays in Exile and Memory, and Alibis, Essays on Elsewhere. He has also written three novels, Eight White Nights, Call Me By Your Name, and most recently, Harvard Square. Born in Alexandria, Egypt, in a multilingual and multi multinational family, Professor Asaman later lived in Rome and then finally moved to New York City, where he now resides. After teaching at Princeton and Bard College, he is currently Distinguished Professor of Comparative Literature here at the Graduate Center, where he also serves as chair of the PhD program in Complit. He is the founder and director of the Graduate Center's Writers Institute. One of our greatest living scholars of Proust, Professor Asaman writes with unparalleled brilliance about the allure of the past, memory, and exile. Michiko Kakatani described his first book out of Egypt as a remarkable memoir that leaves the reader with a mesmerizing portrait of a now vanished world. You will be happy to know that he is currently working on linked novellas entitled Enigma and Other Moral Tales. Please join me in welcoming Alexander Heyman and Andre Asaman to our stage. Do you all have your phones turned off? It might help, uh, but I'm, I've been guilty of that as well. So I want to start by reading a passage from Alexander Heyman's book, and uh, maybe this is going to jumpstart the conversation. And it's about being in America with his family, his parents, and essentially feeling slightly odd about being in America and, and finding Americans odd as well. So here it is, okay? The list of differences, theoretically endless, included items such as our sour cream and tastier than theirs, smiles. They smile but not, don't really mean it. Um, babies, they do not bundle up their babies in severe cold. Wet hair, they go out with their hair wet, foolishly exposing themselves to the possibility of lethal brain inflammation. <laughs> Clothes. Their clothes fall apart after you wash them a few times, etc. My parents, of course, 
were not the only ones obsessing over the differences. Indeed, their social life at the beginning of their Canadian residence largely consisted of meeting people from the old country and exchanging and discussing the perceived dissimilarities. Once I listened to a family friend in what could fairly be called astonishment as he outlined a substratum of differences pro uh, proceeding from his observation that we like to simmer our food for a long time. They do not, obviously, while they just dip it in extremely hot oil and cook it in a blink. Our simmering proclivities were reflective of our love of eating and by extension and obviously of our love of life. On the other hand, they didn't really know how to live, which pointed at the ultimate transcendental difference. We had soul and they were soulless. So that's a beautiful comparison. And it takes me to, to the, the sense that um, I would like you to elaborate on that for a moment. But rather than tearing into America, uh, just explain to me what is it that, and you do go into it in your book a bit, what does this, set, this need to differentiate yourself come from? Well, my parents were talking about Canadians. My parents live in Canada. Um, and so, but it's, it's really the same thing um, in many ways. And it's, it's a form of nostalgia. I don't do that. I've stopped doing that pretty quickly. Uh, and I can tell you how and why. Um, but it's a, it's a way to render um, yourself legitimate. Because if we are comparable with them, then there's a different kind of equality. Um, it's very easy for an immigrant in this country, whatever the background might be, to various degrees, obviously, um, to be perceived as someone who's not exactly fully human in that um, you were not, as an immigrant, you were not exposed to all the possibilities that the American society and, and wealth and, and tolerance provide. And part of the, you know, the great story of American dream, the implicit uh, part of the story is that we were potentially human before we got here, and then it, the humanity bloomed here. Um, and certainly there are possibilities here that were not available over there, but if you ask people who came over here, they felt fully human the first day of their arrival, and they proceeded to feel fully human, and that humanity um, entailed being able to pass various judgments, but also what is commonly referred to as pride. My parents were proud of their food, as they were, and many other people. Um, but the need for comparison is, all, is on, on the one hand, it's a, it's a way to legitimize myself. That is, even if they don't know it, we are uh, comparable to them. We are not inferior in any way. It's also a form of nostalgia. Nostalgia is a retroactive utopia where the past and what constituted, a, constituted our life and us is now reevaluated in, in a different context. And uh, it's a nostalgic move because, you know, all the bad things I raised, all the bad food from the previous life stops existing. Uh, so only good food. We only eat good food. No junk at all. And so to remember that um, through the process of comparison, as it were, and then legitimize it retroactively, the way we have always lived was good. And there's also an aspect of mourning, that is, we can't do that anymore fully. And why did you stop doing that? Um, because you're a nice person? No, no. Well, anyone who knows me knows that, that cannot be true. <laughs> I, I'll, this is how it happened to me. It's a little epiphany. I, before I came to the United States in the, in the fall of 91, Miles Davis died. And I loved music. And, um, and, and I loved Miles Davis. And so I remember this, epif not epiphanic moment, but intense experience where I was high up in the mountains reading. I used to go to... Um, um, mountain camp in the Sarajevo and read for eight to ten hours a day, but also I would listen to music. And I listened to this radio program with, which went through Miles Davis's, it was a survey of Miles Davis's career, five or six hours, just mm. straight through. And I had listened to some things and knew some things, but I had never had a sense how great he was. So when I arrived in the United States, um, the first music that I bought was all those albums that I didn't have, most of them I didn't have, and I didn't listen. This was so long ago, they were cassette tapes. And so I busied myself for a little while, six months, maybe a year, you know, comparing. And I had American friends here, and I, we, I would, we would discuss these things. Until one day I realized, Miles Davis is American. And I had not thought of him as American. I thought of him as Miles Davis. He had 
individual sovereignty that was not, you know, I did not think of as American. My parents and people who compare, and when I compared, they compare um, themselves with an abstract concept of, not with real Canadians, real Americans, but as, it's a kind of a, a people who are the counter projection of us. So, you know what I mean? So that to imagine that we have soul, to confirm that we have soul, we have to imagine those who are soulless. And then after that is imagined, we build an argument toward that person. And I realize that Miles Davis is importantly American, not just by um, you know, the fact that he was born here, but jazz is a fundamentally American music, American musical idiom. It entails and, and it um, organizes, as it were, a large amount of American experience. And I realize if I am going to compare us and them, uh, us and Americans, then I fail to see the Americanness in someone like Miles Davis. Right. And also Miles Davisness in America, if you wish. And so I, I in essence, realized it was unproductive and, um, and useless. Do you think it was somehow, even though it's protective, it could be also regarded as a hostile act? To, to compare? To compare with the, the, in view of belittling the other. Well, it could be, you know, but it's also negotiation. It's, we would like to think that we, we all operate within these um, confines of particular cultures which are strictly segregated because, particularly if they're geographically segregated. And so then we can, you know, in the spirit of tolerance and multiculturalism, we can talk across these borders. So how do you do it? And this is how we do it. And we can exchange those um, experiences, as it were. But my concept of culture, or this is how I think about it, uh, is that they overlap. There's always, to some extent, a common territory. And this is before the fact, or after the fact, of just common humanness. So we can always discuss biology at some level. Um, but there's also, and in this you know, modern world, I, was, I could listen to Miles Davis. I did not come here without knowing what it, it was, um, what American culture was, right. no, at I, least I some part of it. In your book, you say something very interesting, especially in, in around the passage that I read, that in essence, somebody who's a foreigner is constantly struggling um, to, uh, to give himself or herself a narrative stability. Those are your words. The, the concept of narrative stability, I find that very rich. Um, and obviously, you're thinking ahead of yourself as a writer who's going to give himself a narrative stability. But to think more of your parents who came to Canada, um, do they establish some kind of anchoring narrative stability, or is there no such thing open for them? It's more difficult for them because they, they have a hard time operating within the English language. So they are, um, they are spending time with my father's family mainly and people from former Yugoslavia, so then, um, who also many of them, or their generation at least, they're not comfortable in the language, but then there are, there's another generation or two of young people who are either capable of speaking well in, in the language or were born there. So there's this stratification in the, within the family, and, uh, and they, all, you know, they, they see themselves as old. They have been seeing themselves as old since I was five years old. And so... You saw them as old. Did well, they? Of course, but I was <laughs> five. But, okay. But they constantly, you know, went, and, I, and I, I'm nearly 50, and I'm not as old as I would like to be, but still. Um, I don't think myself as old as they used to be. So, um, for my parents, the participation is, is limited, and so they, they go back to the narratives that are already available. And, uh, and for, we have still have a, a place in Sarajevo, and my parents go back uh, every spring for a couple of months and stay in our place where I grew up. And they, as difficult as it is in Sarajevo in various ways, they are revived by this because, to put it very simply, apart from the food, um, what makes them feel good is they do not have to explain themselves. So they do not think that someone expects them to explain themselves. Everything is self-evident, as it were. So people transparent. Know that, right. People share narratives, as, um, personal and collective, but also people know them, so they don't have to tell the story of their lives. I, um, there were times when you know, people asked me, where are you from? And I would think, if I say where I'm from, they'll ask me about Bosnia, political situation, war, which one of the you know, possible identities I might have. And so I would just say Luxembourg. 
because it sounds vaguely familiar. No one knows where it is. You know, <laughs> it's plausible, but so. I have a similar story that I, I do all the time. When somebody wants to find out wh where my accent comes from, I say, you know, I'm French. And then they say, ah, ben, alors vous parlez français, blah, 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 blah. I say, no, 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 because my accent gives me away. So I'll say, no, no, I'm really Italian. Oh, but I'm Italian too. <laughs> At which point I say, oh, my God, now I have to tell them where I'm really from, and I don't want to do that. I, so, now, most often now when someone asks me where, I'm, where you're from, and I don't want to be impolite, and I say, I live in Chicago. <laughs> you mean the way I'm a total New Yorker? Right. Okay, fine. Um, but, you know, there's a, one of the things that I, I didn't want to go into, but you sort of made me go into it and by what you said. It's, think of the example. It's a, such a sort of living example in today's world, in today's month, actually, of those two kids in Boston. In other words, one is totally, seemed to be totally integrated into America, and he's basically doesn't even need to make a narrative for himself. He's just an American kid. The other one goes back. And this going back, so there was a reason for going back, I assume, don't right. you think? You mean going back to Dagestan yes. and Chechnya? Yeah. I don't know. It's hard, you know. Uh, I, I, there are a lot of people, and then it, and Harvard Square, that's, that's present in the character of Kalaj. Um, it is so easy and lazy to expect that by, by virtue of being here as an immigrant, you just have to be happy all the time. Even if things work out, it's a traumatic experience. This transition, because it divides, and this is even if you're not a refugee, there's a difference between immigrants and refugees. Immigrants may choose, or usually choose, to come over. However difficult the circumstances, there's some agency involved. They pick up their stuff and they come here. Refugees are thrown out of their homes and they can't go back. So even if they become millionaires here, the sense of being thrown out of their own home and this loss of arbitrary uh, deprivation of agency implies that it could happen again and again and again, and it's, a, it's perpetual instability. But even immigration is a traumatic, um, easily, it's easy to perceive it as a traumatic event. It splits the life into the before and the after. And just to forget the before, particularly in the world where you can be daily reminded of the before by way of the internet or Facebook or, or you know, television or uh, cheap phone calls, um, it, is, it is still traumatic. I knew a guy, a Bosnian in St. Louis, who had a, a coffee, uh, actually a bar in St. Louis, which looked entirely Bosnian. It was transplanted from Bosnia into St. Louis. And he would, late at night, he had no guests other than Bosnians. And then he had no guests at all. But then um, he would watch snow falling in Sarajevo. There was a webcast. There was a camera in, you know, showing the streets of Sarajevo. And he would there drink alone in his own bar. <laughs> and what snow falling in Sarajevo. Um, he was a refugee. So the traumatic event uh, cannot simply be dismissed as, well, you should be happy. There are all these possibilities here. You, there are many possibilities, that, obviously. But at the same time, the trauma does not quite dissipate, particularly if people are refugees. And the boys from, from Dagestan, there's a history of, of um, displacement trauma in their family, from what I've read. Right. They were thrown out of Chechnya to Dagestan. Then, you know, they couldn't even, when they went back to Chechnya, there was war, and then they came over here. It was not quite a matter of choice as it is for some other people. And this, I imagine, bred a, a kind of general anger and a need to, for this trauma to be addressed. And just to expect them to be happy here, it didn't work. That does not, it's not a justification by any stretch of the imagination for what they did, because, you know, no, I was angry not, too. No at some point, but there are other ways to do that. Yeah. There's something you say in your book which I found very interesting. Once you're roaming around Chicago, suddenly you're, you know, from Bosnia, you're into, in Chicago, and you're walking Chicago, you basically, and you say very sort of laconically, um, I didn't know how to be in Chicago. Um, that could mean many things. Me, you didn't understand Chicago, it didn't speak to you, or it, it means that you didn't know what to do with yourself, or who were you? You didn't know who you were in Chicago. Well, it's all of those things in many ways. <clears throat> what I realized in Chicago, at, at around the time, I started realizing this now, uh, that's what the piece is about, is that how much I was determined by being in a particular space, which was Sarajevo, and um, both metaphorically, but also um, architecturally. 
how my body was used to that particular space, how I was dependent on daily interactions and exchanges, how, I, uh, how um, much I was constituted as a human being, as everyone else, by the presence of all these other people. The way I imagined my life retroactively in the city is, 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 a, is a network in which I'm a knot. And if I'm taken out of that network, well, you know, it's all knotted meaninglessly. Uh, so what I realized I was lacking, what I was missing in Chicago is precisely this way of, of this lateral connection. You know, people talk about roots, but I, I, I prefer to think in terms of branches. My branches were cut off. Roots you can carry around. And, you know, roots are not that valuable in the end. But the branches, the, the, the way I thought my life was expanding into all these other lives and into the space of Sarajevo. And this is what I, I realized, again, in, in retrospect, was I was pursuing in Chicago. There's somewhere where you mentioned in, in, in your attempt to find not roots, maybe branches in Chicago. I mean, you're walking, walking, you go to the movies because that's something you used to do, so it's a familiar way of being. And then you suddenly realize that you also want to play soccer. You want to play soccer because that's what you did, and that's how you constituted part of your identity around soccer. And then you realize that's not enough. You need to play chess, even though chess is a very fraught uh, game because your father forced you to play chess, and you didn't like to lose to him. And eventually, I'm not going to give the ending of that story. But the, the sense is that these are all ancient habits that you're trying to transplant in order to find yourself. What else does one do? when you're somewhere else and you, 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 need to, you need to recreate yourself? Well, all, all of those things are really methods to connect with other people on a different level. Um, I realized in, in Chicago that you know, there are several levels of, of connection with people, personal connection. You can have friends, close friends, and most of my clo close friends I retain. They scatter around the world, but I stay in touch with them and we see um, one another whenever we can. And I, I realized that I needed people who were, you know, let's say that the friends are in the center of this network, and then people who were closer to the fringes, so that you could participate in, in daily exchanges. And to me, it was, you need, I needed a bar in which I knew the owners, of some regulars. I needed a barber so that, uh, you know, um, you can gossip in the, about the neighborhood, a butcher or grocer. And, you know, it provides. Um, Stability that is not unrelated, I also realized, to narrative stability. These people then would have been witnesses of my life in Chicago as I would be a witness of their life in Chicago. If we ended up living as we did, I've had the same barber, which I still use for unknown reasons. <laughs> Maybe I, I should use. use the same barber too. He, he shaves my head. <laughs> it, you know, for 17 years, I know the family. We exchanged yeah. stories. He offered to share his Viagra with me. <laughs> <laughs> He, he, he offered it this because he likes me so much. I've been such a steady customer. He said, do you need some Viagra? And I, I had to find my way out of that. <laughs> but that, that to me was very touching, strangely, because this was the investment of living in Chicago for 20 years. But this is with people. I mean, it's, it's, right. I'm not saying it is strange. Right. But essentially, without people, there is no way you can belong to a place. You no, I don't think there's a place okay. without people. I mean, I mean, basically, without human contact. Right, and. Right. I, I suppose at some point intimate human contact. Right. Uh, I mean, not everybody shares the Viagra with you, I'm sure. No. Uh, uh, but the point it's is. It's too soon to tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, uh, no, but uh, why are we thinking of this? Uh, <laughs> How did Viagra enter the conversation? Uh, you brought it up. Off, but... Uh, no, but it, it's, it's, it's interesting because I've always thought it's, I don't relate very well to people. And uh, with my personality, it's understandable. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the, the real issue is it is very difficult to make contact with people. That's, I mean, superficial contact we can all make. But one that ultimately sort of makes you inhabit a space is very difficult. Um, but I'm, I'm moving now to another idea because, OK, so you've, you've made Chicago your home. You've transplanted yourself. And then you go back to Sarajevo. And there's a very beautiful moment that, where you're walking down the street. And before you know it, you're turning around. Do you want to explain what that is? I was walking down the street. This was the first time um, I returned to Sarajevo after the war. Um, and I was walking down the street. And I 
turned, and I had not made a decision to turn, I turned to look at something, and there was nothing to look at. And I wondered why I did that. And it took me a few moments to realize that I used to turn at that exact spot and thereabouts because the, the space that I was looking at used to have movie posters because there was a movie theater there that closed even before the war. And that my body still remembered the habit of walking by and looking back to see what movies were playing because I, I reviewed movies. There was a film buff. And so it was an important um, piece of urban information, as it were, for me. And so um, what I concluded from that is that, that my body remembered that space. I was, the city was changed in many ways, but the architecture, or the geography, rather, of the city had not changed. It was the same street, the same building. There were all these other pieces missing, but there were the, the structures that were, were still present. And my body remembered this, this architectural um, structure and reacted to it. But then you say something that's also sort of strange. You say that you didn't know how to be a denizen or a complete, sort of in, completely integrated into Chicago, but that you find that now even Sarajevo is slightly foreign to you. Well, I mean, the war changed it. Right. Um, well, it, it, changed it, it changed the people in it, and I was elsewhere. Um, and you know, if cities are things that connect people, quite literally, that is, the streets connect people in various ways. And, Everything else, you know, we can be together because there's a room in which we can get together. Um, then the, the architectural transformation that the war inflicts, you know, complicates um, those interactions. There was a, a great um, book by a Sarajevo writer, Obazi writer, Samezi Mehmedinovic, about the siege. And he talks about um, how you, before the war people would want to be seen on the streets. So they would walk up and down and it was very important to, to be seen. You would dress up to go out and you know, be seen by people. And how the siege inverted that, those same streets that were used to be seen were now the spaces where you do not, did not want to, to be seen. Because of snipers? Or? Snipers, right. And so people would crawl through basements and between buildings and behind you know, garbage containers. The purpose was not to be seen. But that you know, went against the way that the city, any city, but say in particular, in my memory, uh, operated. And this kind of damage, it's, it's simultaneously, it's fascinating to me, it's simultaneously psychological and architectural. Do you, th do you think the Sarajevians have changed since then? Well, I mean, the population has changed because a large number of people have left and then um, other people came in. This happens to cities often um, in various ways. That's what history does. So uh, people have changed. But then that was always the case. There are points in Sarajevo's history when one population left, another one arrived. Uh, and then the city maintained um, certain things, and some, some things changed. It's not a city like New York where you know, people circulate through, but there's no, there are no historical ruptures that can mark different um, types or, or, or registers of, of entering and leaving the city. Can you belong to Sarajevo now? Well, in the book, I, I quote my uh, old girlfriend who, before the war, wanted to leave Sarajevo and, uh, and because she thought she did not belong there. And I told her, possibly quoting from a movie, it is not where you belong, it's, it is what belongs to you. And before the war, I, I mean, I did things that made the city belong to me. It requires agency. Uh, it's not that a city, Sarajevo or Chicago, owe me anything. It is up to me to find things to belong to me. Uh, but so the agency is mine, not, not the city's. Well, let's talk about for one second, not for longer, because we can go on exile for hours. Uh, but the concept of home, um, I mean, Chicago is your home. It is, yes. And you belong to Chicago. Chicago belongs to me. OK. All right. You're going to be this way. And Bye. a few other families. <laughs> home, but actual how property. About, how about Sarajevo? Is it home? It is home, yes. Um, I have the apartment I grew up in. We still own it. My parents were there two weeks ago. My sister, who lives in London, went there. And I couldn't go because I was touring for the book. But I would have gone. You know, you would have gone. There would be many of the neighbors from before the war would have been there. Uh, old friends, my friends. I have friends scattered all over the world. But then there are some. In Sarajevo, it's not you know we you 
in a stable society, a stable life, you might be born in Idaho and then move to New York. And then when you go to Idaho, you say, I'm, I'm going home. It's my parents live, my friends, right. my high school. There's there are residues of your previous life that you can easily connect with. But then you go back home to New York from Idaho. It's not, you can have more than one home in that sense because you know, different parts of your life are, have different locations, different homes. Well, the book as it is, is sort of filled with episodes, various essays, and, and you call the book the, the book of my lives, which suggested to me a certain kind of fragmentation that is inherent in you. Would you accept that as, a, as an idea? There is, well, there are different kinds of fragmentation. There was a time when I thought it was all, you know, in smithereens. It was, right. it was very difficult to put it together, but now there's the life before and the life after, but also the way I um, learned to think about my identity and what, who I am, and then by extension other people, is that we, um, to be reduced to one single identity is a violation of human individual sovereignty and, and, uh, and, and possibilities. So that's what racism does. Right. It reduces people to one identity and then inflicts violence upon them by doing so. So that in some ways I believe I live parallel lives in the present, synchronically, but also diachronically. The history of my life contains several lives. Well, you do say somewhere um, something about exteriority and interiority, and you repeat it quite a few times in the sense that the two have to coincide, and they do coincide, you, you suggest, many times. They do coincide. In some ways, you know, the, the border uh, is... To be aware of the border as firm and unbreakable, it's, uh, it's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I like to think there's a continuity between exteriority and interiority in the sense, for instance, in relation to cities, so that I can consider my interiority only if certain requirements for my exteriority are, are fulfilled. Um, so that I have to walk the streets, and those streets, are, they, they comply with my inner thoughts, or the other way around that you know, the, the, the walking around the city um, uh, generates, the city as I walk through it, generates thoughts and generates um, a particular kind of self-awareness which happens in um, interaction with other people, directly or indirectly. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, supposing you go to visit a city that you've never visited before, where you have no human contact. You're there, let's say, for a reading and you don't know the city, it's in a different country. There's a Bosnia in that city, <laughs> most likely, <laughs> whatever the city is. All right, there is a Bosnian in every yes. city in the world, and he will show up, or uh, she will show up. Many of them I will track down before, and then, okay. then a few will show up. Yeah. Okay, but let's say you I was in the Arctic Circle in Tromso, there was a Bosnian in the Arctic. <laughs> um, well, let's, but I'm trying to, to get to something. In other words, you go to a place, it's totally unfamiliar. There's no way you can project anything on it in order to find some common denominator. There are no Bosnians. There will never be any Bosnians, and you're the only one. And you're there for five days. What do you do? What do you think? How do you grapple with I that? walk around, and there's the sense of being lost that is in some ways rewarding and that um, um, is stimulating. Um, I, I once spent 25 days in Shanghai with my ex-wife the same hotel. They begged us to leave the hotel and go somewhere else and see the rest of China. And I've just wandered around Shanghai. I did not know anyone. Um, and I um, did, did not know the, the language, obviously. Um, and then we wandered around, and, and the city became more and more familiar. But it was also the sense of not knowing where exactly you're going. I had read up um, on, on Shanghai. Um, but I did not know in which direction I was going. So one night we wandered into a Chinese restaurant. They have them in Shanghai. <laughs> but it was, it was not for tourists. We just wandered at some part. And um, there were no English menus. There was, we had a very hard time communicating that we wanted something to eat. They were completely surprised. They thought we were looking for something else. Anyway, they provided this dish. I don't, they made it up on the spot, which I think consisted of chicken bones that have no meat or skin on them. <laughs> They were collecting them for decades, waiting for a, you know, a couple of foreigners, and then they serve it to us. But 
in this restaurant, everyone was Chinese. They had not seen, uh, you know, uh, a, you, uh, an American or European for a long time. There was a poster for Barton Fink, <laughs> the Coen Brothers movie. Entirely inexplicably, in English, so all the letters, it was not a Chinese poster. For some reason, they put up a poster of Barton Fink. There were no other things. Um, and so, you know, it's not that it didn't make it easy. We sat there and ate, gnawed on the bones. <laughs> and looked at the poster for Barton Fink. And the thing is, for five days, if I know that I'm going to be for five days, it, it's not a problem because I'm just going to wander around uh -huh. and I'm going to be lost. To me, I've learned, I've learned to appreciate that feeling of not knowing where you're going and being confident that I'll find my way back to the hotel. A hotel's a familiar for one thing. But if I, it's a different thing, different proposition, if I have to stay there for the rest of my life, then Again, it's, it's much the same process, if more intense, finding things to belong to you, acquiring the language, learning the geography, finding uh, the infrastructure that can help you sustain yourself, the grocer, the barber, the bar, you know, whatever else, the bank. Uh, well, tell us a bit about, talking about language, um, you, you started writing in English. You were writing in English in Sarajevo already, were you not? No, I wrote, you know, lyrics for when I was fantasizing about a rock band, I wrote some lines in English. But when you came to America, eventually you started writing in English. Right. You made a decision to not write in any other language but English. I, well, I made a decision. I thought I could not write in Bosnian at the time because the war, um, my situation cut me off from the language, as it were. Language is kept alive by people who speak it. Yeah. Um, and I had no access to the people who um, spoke it and their experience was changing the language rapidly. And so I realized I would live in the United States for a very long time, very possibly for the rest of my life, and so that I had to write in, in English. Um, eventually, I started writing in Bosnian again, but at that time, I felt that, that I was either not going to write or I was going to write in English. Was this a way of trying to, as we say, sort of create a narrative for yourself in the local language? I did not think that then, but it, it's possible that um, I think there's something in psychology called narrative paradigm, which is the way I understand it, it really means that we are the main characters in the story of our lives, and we perceive our lives as narratives, so that we you know, um, organize them narratively as a series of connected events, uh, and so that a, a rupture or a traumatic rupture blows up that narrative, and then you have to put it back together. And refugees and immigrants have that need, and you know, compar that comparison process is part of that. There was a, 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 a program in Chicago, University of Illinois, that was helping Bosnian refugees um, who were traumatized by war um, uh, overcome their trauma by, uh, by providing testimonies, by, in other words, organizing experiences and stories. As part of the trauma for them was that they couldn't really talk about it, or they could only talk to people who, had already, who also underwent the same trauma, because they were the only ones who could understand. But they could not tell the story to anyone outside of themselves, as it were. And so the therapeutic approach was to have them tell stories to someone who, was not, who had not had the same experience. So I, this, that probably played a role, but I was not conscious of it. I just wanted to write. I had decided I would. I was a writer before I came to the United States. It was an important part of was my life. And so I wanted to do it again. I had felt a need, and I had felt writing as my vocation. So it was, it was very specific. It was not for a therapeutic reason. I just, that's the only thing I wanted to do. That's the only thing I knew how to do, and that's what I did. But then you also t give an example of that as you watch your older daughter observe what's happening to the family. Your younger daughter dies. And you watch your older daughter, the oldest of the two, um, is trying to create a character. She's inventing a character which is going to become like a surrogate or a substitute for the, the younger child who is dying, basically. <coughs> well, she, uh, my younger daughter, was diagnosed with, with very bad brain cancer. Um, and, but around the same time, before I, and, and this is important in the story, that. My older daughter, Ella, she came up with her imaginary brother, Mingus, um, very early in, in that whole uh, process, or uh, my um, daughter's illness. 
So it, it wasn't after she died or after she, because she never really realized she would lose her, that we would lose her. So it wasn't a replacement. It, I, it, it would have happened anyway, I think. Right. It was just that it happened coincidentally at the time when this was happening. And then she deployed this imaginary brother, whose name is Mingus, to process these experiences, which are very difficult to process for anyone, um, but also for her. She would have done that even if it wasn't for illness and death, I think, but to a lesser extent, and I probably would have noticed it less. It was so um, powerful to see her dealing with that. But she was doing exactly what you had been doing for many years. In other words, trying to rehabilitate whatever it is that was being lost. Well, that's one way to look at it. But I, I, that's not how I saw it. The, what she did was that she, because she was three and a half at the time, she had an excess of language. She had more language than experience on the one hand. On the other hand, there was experience that was not in that language for her, and she had no precedent for it and she had no framework, epistemological framework for understanding. Yeah. And so what she did, and this is what I do, and arguably many people who write at least tell stories, she um, uh, invented Mingus, who was then participating in narratives, so that she could deploy the language that she possessed but could not uh, deploy in her own experience. For instance, Mingus would go to California and Seattle, she had never been in California and Seattle. She knew the words California and Seattle, and the words she was too young to conceptualize and to understand what California is without any processing of, uh, in, of, of the word California, the experience of California. So Mingus would go to California, right? And she would tell the stories about Mingus going to California and, and Seattle and doing any number of things. Similarly, when, when uh, we talked about my daughter's, younger daughter's tumor and and tests and hospitals, and then Mingus would um, undergo similar things. Right. Because she would hear those things, they should not know what they mean. But how do you find out what they mean? You invent a story in which they mean. Right. And then this accrues uh, over time. And I thought it was fantastic to watch you, the writer, observe your daughter going through more or less a kind of authoritative and writerly process herself. It is. It, I, what I recognize is is what I do, is that I deploy the imaginary characters who are very close to my life, right? He was her imaginary brother. And he was always present, but never quite there, right? He had a, a, a parallel life. She was telling the story of her life. There was a life of Mingus and her life. Once I asked her, where's Mingus right now? She, you know, she's talking about Mingus. And the way he right now, she said, he's, uh, he's in my room throwing a tantrum. And I, you know, it's easy to interpret this as that she had some tantrum inclination at that moment, but she deferred it to, to um, delegated it to Mingus, who was throwing a tantrum in the other room. Not so long ago, the Mingus, the first emanation of Mingus, this is Mingus the first. He was an inflatable alien doll that we had at the house, and she would carry him around. In child psychology, it's called this transitional, transitional object. But Mingus the first deflated as inflatable dolls tend to, and beyond that, he was just uh, an imaginary uh, character. And she would have conversations with him sometimes. She would yell at him. She would say that he, you know, he talked to her all the time. At least once she said that he didn't really have his own voice. He had Isabel's voice. She didn't speak in her own voice. And that's the daughter that died. That died, right. Um, not so long ago, I asked her, so how come I never see Mingus? She talked about Mingus for years. She's still talking about Mingus very much. So he has siblings. and. There are other projects. His mother is a filmmaker who makes imaginary movies that she can see and watch on her imaginary television set in her room. The, the only real thing is the room. Um, but I asked us, how, how come I never see Mingus? She said, Mingus is imaginary, Tata. <laughs> <laughs> That's <Ooh>. perfect. <laughs> it's a perfect way to end. Um, we're going to take a few questions from the audience. There are, I think there's a, two microphones. Those of you who want to ask us questions, please go ahead. Yes. Um, this question is for um, Himan. Uh, how important is food um, to someone who's exiled? I think it's immensely important uh, because it's, um, it's uh, an aspect, or the aspect of a culture that is relatively easy to reproduce. Uh, but it's also, in a, in a Proustian sense, it is, uh, it is easy to trigger memories 
with the food and reenact, uh, on the one hand, um, trigger you know uh, sensory memories that are so important to uh, for remembering the experience that, that constitutes us. But also around where I, in my part of the world, food was always a collective project. People ate together, they cooked together, they organized food together. It was always a, um, a, a not a public ritual, but <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a family collective ritual. To this day, I cannot stand to eat alone. When I wander around the imaginary city for five hours without anyone, I, um, I know I starve. You start. I starve. I go to Paris alone, and I can't eat in any place in Paris. And then I buy a piece of bread and wander around eating a piece of bread. I need people to eat with. By the way, there's a wonderful moment in the book where he describes <coughs> cooking borscht. Yes, you can cook borscht in America, but it's not the same. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a question. I apologize if it comes across as a very rude question. It's not meant to be. It's actually a very serious question. You differentiate between immigrants and refugees, those who come knowingly and voluntarily and those who are effectively kicked out. In either case, who gives a damn? Why aren't they proud, why are they not proud in both cases to leave the past behind and come and embrace the fact that there are possibilities here which brought them here in the first place? because they would have a hard time knowing who they are. I mean, it's, um, it is very difficult to abandon everything that constitutes you to become something else. It is, and, and there's, I think it's, there's psychological violence in, in that and in more ways than, than one. But it's also um, on a very real level that most of the immigrants are pay, apart from a small group of and refugees for sure, come with very little in their hands, very little property, very little object that they can show as evidence of their previous existence. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard from Bosnians and Sarajevans that the first thing they would get from a burning house, they would run in to the burning house or the burning apartment to save something. What they saved were the pictures. The people risk their lives to save the pictures from a vacation. You know, my, my closest friend did this. His mother deployed him to run into a burning apartment to save the picture. Because we need to have a, our own story. We need to have our own history. We need to have a past and a present and a future. This is what legitimizes us as human beings. This is the difference between a nobody and a somebody. And I think it's so, it's, uh, it's, it's biological t to some extent. Now, you can rationally strive toward, you know, transforming yourself and participating in a society in which you live. I am not endorsing nostalgia as an approach to, uh, obsessive nostalgia as an approach to your life here or anywhere else. But it's the reality of human lives that we remember. That's why it's difficult. You cannot not remember. And if you remember, it's very easy for memories to become stories and then fantasies, unless there's something that can confirm your previous existence. I used to refer in the 90s to my previous life. And I worked for Greenpeace, and people thought I was talking about reincarnation. <laughs> my previous reincarnation, when I was you know, a rat in, in Mumbai. Uh, but I was talking about my life. We have a question. Yes. yes. Hi. Um, my very first month in the United States, eight years ago, I read your story, The Blind Joseph Pronek. And I actually taught it this past semester to my students. and. Everybody had a very strong reaction, as I did during my first reading of it, to the character of not the girlfriend, but the woman whom Joseph Pronek comes to visit. And there's this facile, self-righteous, profoundly American, at least as it is shown in the story, this way of saying, well, you know, I, I understand and I know your experience because I understand it from the news and I am a good person, but it is ultimately empty. And I feel that I've experienced this several times myself. And I wonder, how does that connect to your ability to own Chicago at the very least for yourself while being aware of this other side of things that you clearly experienced? Well, um, it is, it's a, 
there's something in American culture and the way that people, and I mean, I don't mean in high culture, but the way people interact. And I think that's both good and bad in this need to connect as quickly as possible. And one of the ways is to, you know, empathize, because empathy is widely available from Oprah to, you know, any number of um, cultural artifacts. Um, and so there's something, I, I grew to like this to some extent in the United States, because to this day, if I, you know, Bosnians do not smile at each other on the street. When you make a random eye contact with Americans on the street, people will smile. I used to have Russian students, and they would really, really be bothered by it. They would, why are they smiling? <laughs> and they don't, this is what, they don't really mean it, because, you know, smile was a, because it rarely happened, it was a signal that would propel you towards some other quality uh, level of, of interaction. Um, so this need to empathize without actually understanding the need to empathize or to connect becomes a problem without the desire to understand. And so that can be annoying to people. It was annoying to me. But having said this, there's also, you know, I um, would tell people, some people that I'm from Luxembourg or that I, um, I live in Chicago now, but there are people who um, I told the story, if you wish, because there are, there are always people who do actually want to know, but they haven't had a chance to know. And so there, I realized at some point that, well, some of it is my responsibility. It's easy for people who, and I was like that, people who think they're wrong by the world to think that the world owes them something. And so these people who you know, are talking to you with, with facile in, interest, they try harder. And it, it, in some, strangely, it was a liberating moment for me when I realized I can actually tell them. You know? And I, of course, I didn't tell it to everyone, and I would pick and choose who to explain and uh, discuss things with. Um, but there, there's some responsibility on our end, as they were, to tell the story. And rather than think that people just don't deserve to hear the full story because they cannot really understand. Yes. I have a question for you regarding, um, as a first generation American from refugee, uh, and I'm wondering why you have this notion that seems to come across that only the immigrants have this traumatic fracture in life. I think part of the human narrative, which is universal, is there are all kinds of traumas that people experience, and like Americans aren't all these smiling, successful, happy people, as is evidenced, and that um, this literature of difference, uh, I think every, every uh, human has their own story and that I don't find that, I think there's the specificity of you as a Bosnian as opposed to you as a um, Alexandrian or somebody from Germany, whatever, or Luxembourg even, or even Iowa. I mean, there are similarities um, in the differences and I think to sort of have this unique um, history um, or the narrative of the poor refugee, putting it in a higher level or something, I think does have a little bit of a uh, forced nostalgia. Um, what is the question? The question is, <laughs> it's a point um, of view. Don't you think that that is a narrow point of view? Or do you well, have that? Am I, I misreading would, except it? that's not my point of view. It's that I can speak from my experience, but I do not think that the only valid experience is my experience. And even within what seems like my experience, there are degrees. I was not a refugee, strictly speaking, nor am I in exile. Um, and I do not think that Americans are facile and just smiling. It, what we are talking about is a misperception that comes as the price of trauma rather than the fact. My wife is American. My children are American. My enormous number of friends are American. And I feel silly for even saying this. <laughs> um, but the point is that there is a you do not just become American by being dropped here and getting a passport. There's a process, there's a price, and there's a story in that. And the story entails all of the people in this room and in America. And then there's a story of being human with all the possible traumas and losses and sadness. I do not think that you know, I'm a better person or more worthy of, of telling my story than anyone else. But these are the stories that I tell. And if I come up with other stories, I'll tell those other stories too. So this is not dismissing America or Americans as less serious. On the contrary, uh, 
because I'm American now. I have been for quite a while. There's another question coming from this. Uh, <clears throat> my question is going to be more universal. Uh, I remember in high school reading Antigone and not understanding what is this whole thing about burial. I don't understand this. And then <clears throat> listening to NPR today, uh, that this controversy is with us right now, uh, that um, one of the brothers cannot be buried. Um, and I wanted both of you to comment about that. And, and it does deal with foreign and what's our soil and their soil and so forth. Um, I don't know what I could say about it, except that it's exceptionally sad, that the whole story, that, that the violence that perpetuates violence and the sadness that perpetuates sadness, and, you know, it, it would, would be nice to think that we can stop it in some ways. Um, I wrote a book called The Lazarus Project in which a brother is killed and then his sister has a hard time, and this was based on uh, a, a real um, historical incident. She has a hard time retrieving his body. And when she retrieves it, the brain is missing because at that time, phrenology and, uh, and uh, eugenics were sciences. So they were studying his brain to see if there's anarchism in it. Um, they also, you know, he was Jewish, so they recognized his anarchist proclivities in his perceived Jewish features. So what literature does, and this is what makes it universal, is not by leveling off differences. So then we find a story that applies to everyone, but rather we find uh, particular stories coming from particular experiences, then, then we can recognize as shareable. So that n no one um, can live my life, but I do not want everyone to live it anyway. I don't want other books to be about, to contain my stories. I want other stories. Because that way we cover the world as humans. So that everyone can, will tell some sort of story. In the end, there is univers universality of of being human. We live and die, we have biology, we love, we lose, we are displaced to various degrees. And so that all these unconnected narratives, right, are connectable now because they're all these people telling stories from their particular points of, who told their stories from their particular points of view. So the, the suddenly, this, these disparate experiences are, are connected. So we can talk about them. I can answer the question slightly differently. Um, you, who asked the question? I forget. You did, yes. Uh, the, the idea of being buried is very important, far more important than we think. Uh, it's, it's almost easy, and I say comparatively easy to say, I now belong here. This is my home. This is where I've pitched my tent. This is where my roots are now regrowing, etc., etc., etc. But ask anyone who has been displaced, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, now, that's very good. Now you belong here or there, whatever. Where would you like to be buried? In other words, where would it be most meaningful for you to be buried? Yes, you can be buried anyway. It won't matter because, after all, you won't know. But where would you ideally want to be buried? And that's a very difficult question for a refugee or a displaced person to answer because the answer comes in many, many guises. I'd like to be buried where my family will visit me. But that means nothing to me because I want to be buried where all my ancestors are buried, uh, where I was born. But that means nothing to me because I don't belong there anymore. But that's where it would make most sense. And that kind of question really paralyzes our whole, and basically belies everything we would like to believe about our sort of trajectory in life. We have room for two more questions. I'm very sorry. You go ahead. Hi, yes. Um, my question is sort of regarding uh, when you mentioned photographs and that's, that that would be the first thing that people would save and also that you mentioned sort of connecting previous lives and um, you know later lives when you've been displaced or when you move. Um, I, I wondered what, what you felt about social networking or about the internet as a young person. I think that the, the proliferation of photographs and the fact that you can connect all of your, you know, disparate lives on in one place, and that it's become sort of more permanent now to us than we once imagined. I wondered if you had any thoughts about how that might affect younger immigrants or younger people. Who oh, um, well, I've rec reconnected with um, my neighbors and say, well, 
kids of my, well, we were kids together, a particular generation where, like many Bosnians, scattered around the world, but we connected on, on Facebook. And also my high school friends who are all over the, the world again, um, we are connected on, on Facebook. Um, and so there are these uh, possibilities in social media for people who are scattered around the world to create uh, um, a virtual community, I think the cliche is, or, or something like that. Um, which is nice, of course, but then what would be bad about it if that virtual community displaced a real community? Because it is important to be able to touch physically other human beings and to be in the same space with them. But it certainly opens up certain um, possibilities. It also complicates the situation of immigration and displacement and um, everything that we talked about tonight, because you can stay in virtual touch. In the olden days, when people you know, crossed the, the Atlantic to come to the United States, they would maybe write letters. The letters would travel for a month. Um, they could not go back. They would go back, many people, if ever, uh, other than those who returned after a few years, after they made, made some money, you know, at the end of their lives. And they would go to the village or the town. Everything would be different, and so on. But now you can maintain contact in real time. Um, there are, I know Bosnian kids who were not quite born in the United States, but came as, as little kids who you know, have friends in Sarajevo, and then they chat online. And then they go and spend summer there. You know, 50 or 100 years ago, they would not be doing that. They would be melted in the pot. Um, last question. Last, last question. <clears throat> so I wonder, and I'm happy to hear from both of you as well, but as a displaced person who carries this previous life with you, what are the aspects of those lives you find that you feel the need to pass on to those who are coming after you, your American wife, your American children, uh, the food, the language, what are the parts of it that you feel are the ones that, and, and maybe that in the people you know who came from your, from, from where you were before, from your previous life, feel the need to pass on to those who, came, who, come, who come, who are following them, but don't share that previous culture? Well, for my immediate family, my daughter has a particular interest, and it's a very, um, compelling to me to think about it, but I haven't figured it out yet. She, her favorite kind of stories is, tell me a story when you were a kid. And so, and I suspect that she wants to imagine me being a kid so that we can connect at that level, but also that she begins to understand the, the notion of personal history, that once upon a time I was like her and I'm like this now. So she can, uh, she can begin to imagine uh, having a past herself at some point in the future and therefore having a future. So her life has been extended. I mean, it, it seems by, uh, from her question. So I tell her these stories about being a kid. And at first, you know, I made up a lot of stuff, a lot of talking animals involved. Um, but more and more as she grows, I tell her things that are not so um, uh, narratively exciting, but what it was really like. You know, how, how, what kind of ice cream we had. <laughs> when we were kids, or what. And at some point, I suspect, I will start telling her the history of my family, my history, and then we will, and this is what my father did. My, my father was a storyteller. My mother read books, and she read books to me, and she provided books. But my father, before sleep, I asked him the same question. Tell me a story when you were, when you were a kid. And I know the history of my family, and the history within which the history of my family can be understood of Eastern Europe. Um, the beginning of acquiring that knowledge was my father telling the story when he was a kid. And so she's starting that process. So I don't know where it's going to end, and, and you know, I will respond to, to, her, to her interest. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.